tested it with a mixture of heart math and DNA and a lot of Greg Braden's influence <laughs> class that I'm going to put together. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting information. So we're trying to put it in a little better format for you guys. You can be more participating and more handouts and more things like that. So that's, that's why I need the time to work on it a little bit so we, we have it put together for you. <coughs> this is going to be a controversial subject today, so we'll see oh, good. how it works. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And I want to welcome you to our Wednesday class here at Heartlight Spiritual Center. Uh, and if you're online with us, we want to welcome you also, wherever you are, to join with us in this uh, class today. We've just completed a series of classes based upon the culture and the language and the environment of 2,000 years ago and before that actually, but the whole time of the Bible writing, what was the culture of that time. So uh, I hope that you will continue with that study. All I'm doing here with all these classes is just trying to jumpstart you. Uh, so if something grabs you and you find it interesting, do your own research on it. And how many here went ahead and ordered uh, Dr. Rocco's book? do. It, it's a good book to have. It's just one of those books you'll just pick up once in a while and get a nugget of, of truth from it. And it's, very, it's a very easy read, and anybody can understand all of these different idioms uh, and parables, which gives us the deeper truths about uh, what actually has been written. I'm more interested in what was said than what was written. Right? Sometimes you lose in writing it. And you, uh, and you write it, and you read it, and you go, oh, well, I kind of meant that. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it gets lost in the translation somewhere. So today I thought I would tackle uh, what can be seen as a controversial subject among especially the Christian world, and that is the belief in the idea of reincarnation. So to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about reincarnation. A lot of people think it began with a lot of the uh, New Age movement uh, out of the 60s and so on and so forth, that that was kind of when it all started, but that is not true. Actually, it is older than the three mono, mon, monolistic, monolith, monotheistic, I'm sorry, religions, which would be Christianity, Judaism, and Muslim teachings. Uh, before then, it was a pretty much accepted uh, teaching, but that was all changed. So let's look at a little bit of the history. Origen, that's O-R-I-G-E-N of Alexandria, who lived in about the first and second centuries before or after Common Era. So we're talking within a two year or so, 200 year or so span after say Yeshua uh, walked the earth, that things were a much different spirituality than, uh, than when it was finally organized by man into these different religions, which we know that Christianity came out of the meetings of the, uh, uh, the church fathers uh, in the Nicene Council in the third uh, century or fourth century. And um, a lot of things were re- uh, edited and looked at and taken out and put in. So a lot w of what happened the first 200 years is pretty much lost by the time we get to the writings of the Bible and the translations of the Bible. Uh, one thing that I have tried to teach you throughout my, my time here is the importance of something that is called the restitutions of all things spoken by the mouth of the prophets. Now that's a, that's a promise, that before the full age would end, and the word probably is translated in the Bible, world, so people think the end of the world is the end of the earth, and those are two different things. Earth and world are not the same thing. 
The world means a system of thinking. It means the systems that come out of a certain thinking. So we have world systems. So you have to look at the world system of finance, the world system of religion, the world system of science, the world system of education. All these things that are really being very much challenged right now in the sense of what we've been taught in those systems are proving in the time of expansion of information to not be true at all. Much that we heard about DNA is not true. Much of what we've heard, we know of religious doctrine is just not true. A lot of things that science is finding out because of the expansion of technology, uh, this new tele telescope that's out there, oh my God, I don't know if you've seen it, the pictures of it, but it is changing everything we thought about space. In fact, it is proven in the quantum teachings that there is no empty space out there at all. And the, the, the artistry, so you might want to look that up. I can't think of the name of it. Can somebody? James, 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 James Webb, Webb Telescope. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. They may very soon be able to see the beginning of the universe right after the so-called Big Bang happened. So this is going to change a lot of things. And of course, one of the things that's going to change a lot is religion. And that's uh, where a lot of um, resistance is coming right now uh, because of the fact that there is new information out that cannot, that does not prove some of the teachings that we have been given in Christianity. So, origin of uh, Alexander was a great Roman fountainhead of, for Christianity, but was a believer in reincarnation as a part of Christianity. So, reincarnation was a part of early Christianity. So, it's not always separate from, but it's just been changed, things have been taken out, things have been put in, and, 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 and uh, I want to finish my thought there on the, on the prophecy of all things. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit, because I didn't finish that. So it says that before the age actually ends, now you can call this age the age of uh, um, Piscean age, which we know astrologically is ending, and we're in overlapping with the age of Aquarius. Uh, in the Bible, it's called the kingdom age. Mm -hmm. uh, it's changing from the new from the church age. See, we've had almost uh, 18, 1700 years of the church age. And when I say the church age, I mean the man-made church age uh, has been, been there. So, uh, however you want to call this shift that's going on, the fact is that there is the overlapping of the two right now. And uh, before the, the new world, the new age, uh, whatever you want to call it, eon, uh, epoch, uh, there's many names for it, begins, there has to be the full restoration of everything that was told to us in the past that's been edited out has to be restored back to us. How many understand that statement? So if it's been lost before the age can fully come in and stabilize itself as a new norm, all of that has to be restored back to the people. And that's why you've seen this so-called new age movement, which is a misnomer. New age is not new age. New age is a lot of people who went back and picked up a lot of indigenous teachings that have been lost through Christianity. Native American, Aborigine, Kabbalah, myst mystical Jewish is Sufi, the mystical Islamic. See, all of them had a mystical period that's totally different from the time in which man came in there and organized it into a major world religion. And that's been lost. But now it started uh, coming back again, I believe actually in the 60s. I think the 60s was uh, kind of a um, double thing that happened. Um, uh, but it was, it was the awakening of something in the collective soul. It really was. And that awakening began to affect the way in which the, the church system age had formed us to believe, such as women begin to feel a power within them awakening. Women did no longer want to be some man's little woman, 
staying at home, taking care of the kids, not working, and all that role that my, well, I, my mother was kind of rebellious, so I can't use my mother, but uh, her, my aunts and stuff were different kind of women. But most women had uh, begin to fit into the role that they were given them as to what it means to be a woman, to be a wife, to be a mother, all those kind of things. And that began to uh, fire up in the collective female consciousness that women didn't want to be in that place anymore. They wanted their credit, they wanted uh, their rights, they want still fighting for equal pay and, and to be recognized as a man is on the job and all that kind of stuff. That's been going on for a long, long time. Then it began to change in the racial consciousness. And all of a sudden, the African American uh, culture decided they did not want to be put on the other side of the tracks of the white people, that they wanted some rights, and we began to see the awakening of the civil rights movement. Also at the same time, we begin to see an awakening in the, uh, in the uh, gay community as the gay people decided, I don't want to live in the closet all my life. I don't want to live a double life. I want to be who I am. And we begin to see the gay rights movement starting. So all these things are born out of something that begin to awake within the collective soul uh, of the country and of the world. Now in America, as far as I'm concerned, we're a little behind a lot of European uh, cultures that are a little bit more advanced and, and less uh, affected by fundamentalist type religion, but uh, begin to accept uh, things a little faster than we did. But we are coming along, in fact we're being drug along uh, to change some of these things in our culture uh, in that way. So everybody understand that, that things have to be restored back to us that we have forgotten, that has not been uh, taught that has been edited out of these religions. And how that comes forward is in the form of something called revelation. Revelation. And that's kind of what I do. I'm really a revelation speaker. I take things and get a revelation on it. And that's what I was known for in the 80s as a revelation preacher or whatever. I could take the Bible, I'd get a download, get a revelation on it and, and would teach it differently than it had been taught through the doctrines of Christianity. So that's how I've made my, my ministry, my life basically upon that and still continue to, to do that uh, as much as I, as I can. So we are in the overlap of that time in which there are things still being uh, brought back to our remembrance that we once knew. But I want to say at the same time, something else is happening on another level, and you've got to think this way now, not this way. Mm -hmm. So while this restoration is going on and the restoring of things, uh, like sweat lodges and drummings and medicine wheels, and medi all that kind of stuff, that's old stuff, but everybody says, oh, you're into that new age stuff. You go down there at that new age place where they do drumming and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. It was older, much older than Christianity ever thought of being. So it's coming back. And so there are things that are still trying to come back to us. And that's what we want to be here at Heartlight is a instrument for that to be able to flow through us that was once taught in the more ancient wisdoms and the time before man organized it and given back to us so that we can finish up the church age of 2,000 years and get on with the other one. <laughs> I'm ready for the new one to come through, but it just can't until we uh, clear out the karma of the last 2,000 years. And trust me, We've built a lot of karma in 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. The wars, the inquisitions, the things that we have done. Christianity has not always been a gentle religion. It's been very violent. It has hurt people. It has slaughtered people. It has done it in the name of their, of their God, of, of, of Christianity itself. I told you one of the most interesting Bible scriptures that is just written as it is written, but it says, and it's mostly it's coming from Yeshua, Jesus, but it says there's a time in which they will cast you out of the synagogues and they will kill you thinking they have done God a service. And if you're not living that today, that people would shoot you and think that they are getting rid of the devil by getting rid of you. 
I mean, that's how severe it is and unsafe it is out there, that a lot of what is being done is being done in the name of people who have had this religious teachings uh, that I'm not you, you're not me, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the killing of all the Jews, uh, the, the placing back of the African Americans, the gays back in the closet, all that right now today as you sit here is trying to go on through the legislatures and through the, the uh, powers to be that is trying to change all these things and take women's rights back. And it, it, it's just, I gotta say this, it's so ironic to me and I don't mean to get all political here, but I don't get all these people on the far uh, right are all about, we want our rights. We want our guns. We want to do what we want to do. And at the same time, taking the rights away from people right and left. The very thing that they say they're fighting for is the thing that they are doing in trying to take women's rights, gay rights, African-American rights, and so on and so forth. It just makes no sense to me, and that's all I will say about that. Amen. Mr. Director. And you're right. So Origen believed to have lived in 185 to 254 CE, that's the common era, during a time of widespread persecution of Christians. Origen believed that all souls are on a journey of salvation, even if it takes innumerable ages to do so. He reasoned that a single lifetime is not sufficient for a soul to achieve to full salvation. Now don't get stuck with the word salvation because it don't mean what you think it is here. It's from the word sozo in the Greek and it means healing. Doesn't mean come down to an altar and feel bad about yourself and beg for forgiveness. It has to do with the healing of error in the mind or enlightenment, same thing. He also reasoned that some souls would require more lifetimes than others for education of healing. In fact, he believed a, a sort of continuity between the present body and the body in the next lifetime was the main time. However, his teachings was eliminated from Christianity by Constantine. Constantine is mostly the Christianity that you have today and his influence in changing so many things. Constantine wanted to be certain that people did not believe they had a second chance. So the Council of Nicaea throughout reincarnation in 325 AD. Up until then, reincarnation was an accepted teachings in the early pre-Christian church. Oh, so I want to talk first of all a little bit about is, is it at all mentioned uh, in the Bible? And I'll give you some thoughts on that uh, that I just kind of jotted down this morning before I, before I left. In Matthew 11 and 14, it's kind of interesting it says that they could not accept that Yeshua was the incarnation of the divine, or they would say the Son of God, same thing. The Son of God merely means that that is a human being who has discovered the incarnation of the divine into its humanity. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> but according to the prophets, this could not happen until Elijah or Elias showed up first. So they were not accepting this because there was no Elijah. Elijah had left. You know the story of Elijah? He walked with God and was no more. He's one of the people that translated without physical death in the Bible completely into life itself. So Elijah's a real player here if you get into the keys of Enoch and Elijah and all that kind of stuff. But here's what is interesting that it says in this uh, portion of scripture. And I, I just kind of wrote down the best I could. It says to review this idea, they turned to John the Baptist and said, this is Elijah. Hmm, that's in the Bible. Oh. John the Baptist did come back, but
but in the physical form of John, uh, John uh, Elijah did come back in the form of John the Baptist. He said, this is he. Also in uh, uh, Matthew 16, 13, 14, some say, this is a kind of repeat, but a different way. Some say uh, that you are, because G Jesus had asked one of the major disciples, who is the people saying I am? He was interesting. Who, who the, how are they identifying me? What do they say that I am? And, uh, of course, Peter. Now, Peter means what? If you take the disciple into inner discipline, what do you have? Peter to what? Faith. Faith. Thank, Thank you. you. Good unity teaching right there. <laughs> Peter becomes our inner discipline of faith. Okay. So, <clears throat> Jesus says, who do they say that I am? And Peter said to them, well, there's some over here, and they say that you are John the Baptist, come back. But there's another little group over here that says that you are Jeremiah of the Old Testament, come back again. And then some, all these people had all these different people that they thought Jesus was the reincarnation of. Now, nowhere in these scriptures that I'm giving you was a rebuke of reincarnation. You'd think if reincarnation was the worst thing that you could believe in, that Jesus would have reprimanded them and said, you can't believe that stuff. Don't teach that stuff. But he did not because it was taken for granted that that's the way things happened. So he turns around again and says to uh, John, John the Baptist and tells the people, thou art Elijah return. Now, none of these was what Jesus was looking for. That's not the answer he was seeking. The reincarnation. Now, I'm going to take this care because this is going to be mixed with the revelation now. Jesus, Yeshua, was bringing in a whole new age and order. Okay? It was the new age of his time. Now, what age were they moving out of? They'd had in the Old Testament, they'd had the age of? Law. Law, law, law. 613. Yeah. Old Testament is law. New Testament is grace. Okay? So now we're moving into a much better covenant. This is going to be much better than that other one because that other one was based on 613 do's and don'ts and what to wear. and It really was, was tough to do that. And Jesus says, oh, forget all uh, about 611 of them and let me give you a couple of them. Love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord thy God with all your heart and upon this hangs the law. Wow, that's huge. If I'm trying to keep 613 laws contained in ordinances, worry about eating your shrimp, your pork, not mixing linen with wool, and all this crazy stuff that is mentioned in there, Jesus says, I got a better way for you. And it's all within two laws. Love yourself and your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Upon these two hangs the law. So the law got hung as we entered in and moved from the order of Aaron. That's the Old Testament. High priest Aaron, which is Moses' brother. And uh, Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to renegotiate. I really like this. Jesus said, let's, let's renegotiate the covenant. How many know what a covenant is? What a, it's a promise, an agreement that is made between two parties, right? So Jesus said, I think we can improve on this one. This one has failed. And, and the Bible is clear to tell you that the law failed and came short 
And there was a need for a new covenant to be made. So Jesus is in the negotiator. Now, in the course of miracles, they, they said this way, that Jesus was the instigator of the atonement process of undoing the human ego. Same thing. Same thing. So, um, wow. So Jesus says, okay, I have a better deal for you. So he negotiated a different covenant called the New Testament covenant. But another thing they did is he changed the priesthood. Up until then, there was only one priest that represented all the people. I say this is going to be a few weeks so I get into this reincarnation thing. But let's just, let's just go with the flow. Do they call it a priest or they call it a rabbi? High priest. High priest? High priest. Okay. Even, the, the, even the Jewish people call it the high priest. Okay. The high priest. And of course the high priest is the only one that made atonement for the Israelite people. They did not have individualized salvation. <laughs> so once a year, the high priest would go in behind the veil where nobody was allowed to go. The veil kept everybody out. What was behind that veil? The Shekinah presence. The true presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat. Everything that represents the most holy part of yourself which has been veiled off by religion, that you don't go there because you stay out playing around in the courtyard with baptisms, the labor, all these rituals that the scripture says it is time to leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ, not laying again the foundation of baptism and of faith, but going on unto perfection going on, going on. That's been the hardest thing I've had to do is trying to get people to go on out of that. So, hmm. what was I saying before that? Somebody help keep me on track here. So, um, so, so the, okay, so the, 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 but here's the thing that's cool is what I'm telling you about 2,000 years ago you need to learn it because that's what you're doing it. Only you're not one Jesus, but you're a collective Christ. Oh, Woo! Okay. Felt that one. Yeah, like that. See, no more one man. No more one man. It's over. Jesus brought that to an end. There'll be no more separate one man messiahs or gods, or teachers, or gurus, or preachers, or priests, or rabbi, because I'm going to show you that what I am, you are too inside yourself, and then we're going to come together on a collective level until we can shift the entire age. Yeah, you feel that yeah. one? Yes, I do. Yeah. So Jesus brought us to what's called the Melchizedek Order. So if you read, you can read about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, and here's some of the characteristics of Melchizedek order. It is those, first of all, of an endless life. What does that mean? That means those who know that they, they are eternal, individualized expression of God have entered into the beginning of the, of the uh, Melchizedek order. So you have to know you're of an endless life. Which, which is totally different than even reincarnation. Because reincarnation is about living and dying, living and dying, and living and dying. Jesus says, no, I bring life. And more abundantly. There's a difference in what he was bringing. Everybody else was trying to figure it out through dying and living and dying and living and dying and living and dying and living. And Jesus said, through all that journey that you've been through in you all the time was the eternal presence of life with no beginning and no end. But people didn't know that. So you have to come to be a part of the negotiation of the, of, the, uh, of the Melchizedek order. You have to be one of an endless life. The next thing is without mother and without father. So you cannot take your identity by 
who you are by the flesh. That has to go. That has to go. That means race consciousness, gender consciousness, all the, the hang-ups that we have about being a human body has to be put aside as we connect to our inner core essence of who we truly are as an eternal divine presence or being that we are. So, do you have something? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what, so, what's the difference between incarnation and reincarnation? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> very good. That's very good because this this gets very uh, in into some things that are important to us. So, reincarnation was so important until Jesus. Whoa, what does that mean? Let's see if I wrote some of this down. I tried. Hold on here. Um, okay, well, I can do this. I don't have to look them up. All right. The first thing is that we have to look at is that you have the beginning of the story of the Old Testament begins with the, uh, the name or term Adam, right? That's who shows up kind of first uh, in, this, in this story. Now, I, in the Bible story we're talking about. <laughs> Maybe not in other stories. But in the Bible story, it kind of begins with this idea of this Adam and Eve story thing here. And uh, this first Adam, hmm, I, I don't know how to not get into certain things. That, okay. the, first, the first Adam, and I, what, what have I taught you? Some of you help me out here. What have I taught you about the name Adam? He's a man. Adam. 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 A man. Adam. Yeah. What? Adam. Man. Adam. Adam. It's, it's congealed light. Adam. Light. Light. Congealed light. Very good. Very good. I like that one. And why? Because uh, Adam is a what? Transliterated word. Thank you, Tom. Good, good for you. I like this. So Adam is transliterated from Adam. The Aleph red is for blood. So the fall of consciousness happened in the bloodline of the man who walked this earth. Mm-hmm. Now, this gets touchy. This is why the Bible is a bloody book. So if you don't like that, all that blood sacrifice, Jesus shedding his blood, oh, I don't want to hear about that. But you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and you're not getting the deeper metaphysical meaning of what those things mean that has to do with you. You go to the doctor's office now. What do they do to see how healthy you are? Draw your blood and look at the blood, and everything is based on your blood test. They hardly check you at all anymore, but it's what the blood tells them. Because the blood holds consciousness. Now, let me give you some scripture on that. Life is in the blood, it says. Life is in the the blood. So you have two things going on in the blood. You have your DNA story, right? Which is not life, but it gives you a living. Hmm? I'm looking, these bodies I'm looking at right here, we had a birth and most likely we'll maybe have a death unless something real supernatural happens here. We're probably, because whatever is, is uh, born and lives will die. But within us is the essence of life, which has no beginning and has no end. That's why there's a continuation of this idea of afterlife. Right, of course. There's no really after or before, there's just life. Are you with me on that? 
Okay. So, <laughs> life is in the blood. Then, this, this fall was a lowering of a vibration frequency that ended up in the blood that shut off the, this, the divine consciousness that was in the blood was shut off in that. So that's really what a fall is. The fall is a fall in vibration just as uh, water is a fall in the temperature of steam. Or steam is a lowering of temperature into ice, right? So as we begin to become more dense, the more we left behind a lot of our uh, spiritual consciousness. Didn't go anywhere, it was just put out, put out of activity. We were not conscious of consciousness. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get conscious of consciousness. And when we are conscious of consciousness, consciousness becomes conscious of us. <laughs> As who we truly are. Yeah. So, we know that in this... Um, okay, so, uh, life is in the blood... And we'll give you another scripture. And the life is the light of all mankind. Book of John. And, and life is the light. So if I got life in my blood that has been, has fallen to a lower temperature or frequency that had solidified itself as this substance of blood that holds my life in it, right? But because I've taken my identity through the bloodline of my parents and their parents and their parents until we all have a different bloodline. I don't think we have anybody that shares the same bloodline or DNA here. Every one of you have different mothers and fathers and bloodlines and genetic stories and whatever. But you also have another story in your blood. And it's the blood of your eternal creation. Of who you truly are. Now, I, I'm probably not doing well in explaining this because I know it's a deep subject, but I want you to understand. Life is in the blood, and the life is the light of all men. It is proven, and you can look this up. They have proved that human blood is congealed light, just like Karen said. She was absolutely correct. Blood is congealed light. Now, we talk a lot about the blood of Jesus, but here's the thing that is missing in that story, is he transformed his blood, his human Jesus blood, to divine life on the experience of the transfiguration on the high mountain. If you don't know that story, he went to a high mountain, high mountain. That means a certain high state of consciousness. He took with him certain elements. He didn't take them all. He didn't take Thomas the doubter, he didn't take that. He took John Love, he took uh, James, and he took these three specific disciples with him. And through that experience, the transfiguration, what was transfiguration? It was the outraying of his inner light outside of him until he wore his inner light as a garment on his mortal body. Whew, I will say that again, that's powerful. Yes. I... I I need to bring a Bible here to read this to you. But it says in the transfiguration that the light that was in him outrayed him out here and he wore his light as an outer garment. What is that called? You probably might know. Oh, your orba. Oh. No, your merkaba. Oh, merkaba. Okay. Your light body. The light becomes your outer body swallowing up your old fleshly human body into itself. 
And that's why I've kept saying to all the new thought people for the last few years, don't stop with the within message. People are satisfied to know that God's in me. The kingdom of God is within me. This is within me. But have you ever thought that what's in you wants to come out of you? Don't use meditation to go visit those who are in prison. That's what we're doing. We're going and visiting maybe 20 minutes. I, I do a 20 minute in the evening, uh, definitely. And so I go visit for 20 minutes. I get to, I get to slow down. I get to feel a little bit of peace and some good stuff. I like that 20 minutes. I really do. And then I come back to my outer world and leave that all in here. So whatever Jesus did was a prototype for the collective. So he wants us all to have a transfiguration of going to a high state of consciousness in which the life that is in our blood is released until it swallows up into a light, becoming a light being. Um, so, and I, got, and I got to do this. I got to do this. And, and I just did this recently with you, but I'm going to do it. When I came into Soma Energetics, <laughs> I can't deny this part of my life for 23 years. It's definitely a part of my path. But when I came into this and was so challenged, like I really had a good thing going. I had to build a wonderful ministry. Had followers all over the United States and doing well. But to go into tuning forks is, oh my God, what are they going to do to me? So it was a, truly a, what I call a, cro a, 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 a cross in the road. Yeah, it was a fork in the road, literally. And I really needed something to validate this. And in sitting in my office in Indianapolis, everybody was gone. I was just there quietly. And a book falls out of a bookshelf over to my left. And I've told you this before, I'm going to say it again. But I, I, my left brain said, okay, we're on a very busy street. Big trucks come down here. And I'm sure some truck has vibrated that off on there. But something inside said, no, no, don't go there. So I go over to this book. And I've had this book for years. Never, never thought of even tackling this book. Big, thick book called The Keys of Enoch. Heavy duty stuff, let me tell you. Really heavy duty stuff. But it had opened on the floor and I picked it up and this is what it said. The thought adjusters are here. The thought adjusters, I thought, ooh, I really like that. I think I'm kind of a thought adjuster. I adjust a lot of people's thinking about stuff. The thought adjusters are here. And it says, that they are here to release ionized consciousness out of the blood, get this, through frequency attunements. I went, whoa. This is going to be done through using frequency and vibration in a certain sequence that is going to awaken the inner code that has been put to sleep in us. I want to say something to you all. This is, this is, the ego wants you to think it's human beings that need to wake up. What really needs to wake up is the divine in us because it's been put to sleep. The minute we did not know who we were and put it all on a God out there, we totally put that within us in, into an act, inactive state. Didn't get rid of it. You can't destroy it. But we put it in an inactive state and we no longer taught it. We no longer thought it. We no longer believed it because it just become ob obsolete to us. And because religion, yeah, they didn't teach it to us. They didn't tell us. And therefore, it become for a long time very obsolete. But as it's beginning to awaken in us. Do you remember the story? And I, I tell this a lot, too, about how the... People were on a ship and the waves were tossing and it was a horrible, horrible storm. Oh my God, it, was, it was, uh, looked like they were going to probably lose their life over it. And they tried everything they knew. You know, they were trained in navigation. They understood how to do the sails and all that, but nothing was working. Not a thing was working that they thought 
should have worked because of their training. And at the last moment, out of desperation, someone says, remember that guy that's down there in the boat asleep? Oh, him, that, that hippie guy? <laughs> I mean, he has no training. He's not a captain. He doesn't know how to navigate. He's just down there asleep. Somebody said, go get him. And they went into the bowels of the ship, into the subconscious of our being, and awakened that. And it came forward and says, peace, be still to the storm. And it was done. Wow, I wish it could be that easy, <laughs> you know? So there is an awakening of the I am presence that is basically uh, in us. Okay. Looks like we have to go through a storm before we can... It sure looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it just seems like it's... Uh, yeah, and I think all the training that all of you have been under is to prepare for you this time to be able to go through whatever storms are coming our way. And I can't promise you an easy ride for a while, so prepare yourself to find the eye of the storm. Find the I am of the storm. Because the I, no matter if the storm gets worse and worse, the I stays in the stillness of it. Okay, so what I'm, mm, <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is the fact that for the for the first the first person on the planet human being whatever you want to say to awaken out of this stupor that's what it says adam went into a stupor or translated the word sleep and a deep sleep came upon adam and the light was put to sleep in the blood of mankind not only that, but his feminine was taken out. And the separation of the male and the female was through gender or the human body. And all of a sudden, male and female became man and woman. No longer was it male and female. It was man and woman. And therefore, the female was lost in the male or the man and the, and the masculine was lost in the woman as they separated and took their identity in bodies only. So, all that has to be corrected. All that has to be corrected. You, you cannot, and what we're going to get to, is you cannot hold back on the work that you need to do in this lifetime because there may not be another lifetime for you to come back into in linear time space. If you, could, if you could connect with that statement, you would start committing more and more to do the work that needs to be done in your life. But if you're taking this thing, oh well, if I don't get it now, I'll come back and get it then. Now, why I believe that that's over for me, I'm no more coming back into another incarnation in this third dimensional world that I live in. Mainly because in this lifetime, I learned who I was. And the minute that I said, I am God, the most blasphemous statement that you can make to a fundamentalist Christian, <laughs> I am Christ, I am God, I am the divine, I am the sacred, I am the light, I am the life, I am the peace, I am the joy. Yeah. Woo. And stop trying to get it because you don't have it and start being it because that's what you are. Yeah. 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 Then you have completed an incarnation that has gotten you where it wants to you to be where you can now begin your true spiritual climb. And that climb was Jacob's climb when the ladder went from earth into heaven 
And now the latter, the rungs of consciousness have been placed to move from three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, so dimensions. So, the Bible says that when Jesus came, and it's so hard for me to keep throwing out Jesus thing, because I know you all want to go back to the religious Jesus, and I'm not talking about the religious Jesus. I'm talking about the one that was before religion, who is not the Christian, but is the Christ of God. So, don't get into so much the historical aspect of this thing as the metaphysical. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to us today? I don't want to just talk about his story, but I want to talk about my story. His story is history. My story is mystery. And when the mystery of God is finished, and time shall be no more. I am free from time, space, and the linear world, of, and freed from the process of reincarnation. All right. Hmm. Can you step back a minute? And we were talking about earlier people who have brought spirituality to us. We can go even further than that, get back into the continent of Africa and say that Africans were far more aware of spirituality than the present day people because we have evidence of it on caves through word of mouth. They talked about, uh, they saw spaceships coming down. They saw uh, on the caves, they had spaceships coming down. They're talking about entities who helped them from other worlds and so forth. Mm -hmm. But because it wasn't written down, <clears throat> and that understood at that time, it was ignored up until now. Right. And Africans who were born from Africa to this United States were, have, were told not to, uh, and trained not to think about the spirituality that they brought from Africa, and it was eliminated in the African-American race up until recently. Right. That is true. Of course, that's not the only places they found it. They found it in the Sumerian tablets in the Middle East also, all of these things. So it's all been out there for so long, but I did happen to just read recently about the African uh, uh, was much more spiritually connected to, to things as uh, When I visited Brazil and across the South America, you know, Europe and so forth. Right, yeah. right. And that's the stuff that has to be restored back to us before yes. we can absolutely bring in the fullness of the, of the new age that we're bringing in today. So much. Just stay with me. There's, this is going to get really good when we get into the meat of reincarnation. But I, uh, for the first time, I want to set the stage a little bit so that we can know a little bit of where we are, we are coming from. So here's what I think. This is David, or what I think has been given to me. Jesus is referred to as the Last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, the first man Adam was made a living soul, get that, step down from life to living soul. That means a living soul can die because what lives can die. And people don't believe that the soul dies because they think it's eternal because they're confusing it with the spirit. But actually, the soul does die. And the Bible said, the soul that sinneth it shall die in the Bible. So there's a real, uh, it needs to be real teaching about the soul thing. People do not understand what the soul is whatsoever. And they confuse it a lot with the, the spirit, which it is that, but it's also a different part. Um, so uh, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, speaking of Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. So here you got this story from Adam to Adam. This Adam is asleep. No place did it say. See, they have this idea that God put Adam under 
operated on him, took out a rib, made Eve, and then he woke up after the operation. No, nowhere does it say that he woke up at all. So the human mind of the planet became a sleeping consciousness. A sleep of itself, a sleep of its truth, of its purpose, of why it's on earth. All of those things are lost to the memory of, and brought into the subconscious or unconscious part of ourself. So it makes me think that the first Adam ends up as the last Adam through all of the incarnations that it made to get there to the point it had the state of enlightenment or awakening. So that means that soul that was the first Adam could have been the soul of Abraham, could be the soul of Moses, could be the soul of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on and so on, until David, oh boy, when David shows up, we got it now. We got it now. David is a, is a plant from heaven. David is not into Yahweh. No. 19 dynasties of kings under Yahweh. David was one of them, but he's the only one that dared to plug in to El Elyon, the Most High God, who's going to show up with Mary to produce the Christ in the incarnation of Jesus. So David already tapped in to the age that was to come. The Bible said he tasted of the world or age to come. So even in his time of law, he tasted of God's grace because David was a mess. People think David was a saint. He was not. He, he murdered a husband to get to the wife and committed a... He did all kinds of crazy stuff, and yet God said... Oh, I love him because he's a man after my own heart. And that's grace. You see, they didn't have grace. Because in the Old Testament, if you did certain things, you got your hand cut off, or you got blinded, or you got killed, uh, which is still going on over there right now. You get stoned. And I don't mean stoned in a good way. Don't even go there. Don't you go there. No, don't you dare go there. But I mean, you, there was no mercy. Somebody caught an adulterer, was killed and stoned right on the spot. But David wasn't because he was under a world to come, under the grace of that which is, would come later. But here's the thing about David that's really cool. Oh, my time's up. Is he was of the bloodline of Judah. This bloodline carried all of the true pure priesthood of God through the bloodline of the house of David. David, Solomon, and right down to Jesus who is also of the bloodline of Judah. That's why you can say Jesus is a Jew because he was from Judah. And that's what's called a Jew is only those from Judah and Benjamin came together, formed a southern kingdom. The north all went this way. And the first time you read the word Jew in the Bible, it's the Jews fighting the Israelites <laughs> because they were two different kingdoms completely. Two different kings, Rehoboam, and I can't think of the other one, but they were totally separated to house of Judah and this, the ten tribes. Now, the house of Judah was to remain known as the house of Judah, or Jews, in the world. But the ten tribes were to lose their identity and be scattered throughout the entire world. And if you study those tribes, you'll see before they lost their identity of who they were, that they traveled through Europe and they, they traveled through uh, a river that they call the, the Dan, Ub, out of the tribe of Dan. 
They carried uh, Peter's uh, uh, stone that he laid his head on and put it under the coronation of Westminster Abbey where the king and queens are coronated in London. And that's why they're called Brit-ish. Ish is man in Hebrew. Brit is covenant. They were to bring in the covenant people. Then they were to flow over First, they're to become a commonwealth of nations, which is what Great Britain did. They were all over the world. Yeah. Then they said they spill over the wall, we'd say the pond, and ended up in America <laughs> as the USA, United Sons of Abraham. Some of you sitting here can be of the lost tribes of Israel and don't even know it. I know that there are African Ethiopian tribes that are finding their roots also with Israel. So all of this is kind of wakening up and we're finding out we're just not who we thought we were and who we were told we were. This is a tremendous time uh, in that in that way. So our time is up, but stay with me. I got some good stuff to give you. Uh, I just felt I wanted to just share out of my heart today. Yes, Bonnie. I read this in the news. I don't know how true it is, but if you're born after 1940, you have the capability to living to 125. Mm -hmm. Amen. That. That's good yeah. to me. People get a fortune. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got health insurance. <laughs> That's a good point. We better, yeah, we better get, uh, we better get better uh, insurance and stuff than, than that kind of thing. Everybody here is uh, 1940 and over. <laughs> We're not going to make it. Somebody like before that. that. <laughs> All right. If you will uh, give uh, your offerings today, appreciate it so much. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Anybody have any Thank questions you. or anything? I, I'm Thank glad to. I'm glad to stay with you. It's Peggy's birthday. Yes. Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Maggie. Happy birthday. So, does any of this kind of make some sense to you? I know this is all new way of thinking, but that's what I'm here to do, is to uh, try to get you to see things a little differently. As you see, I've dug deeply into this subject of the lost tribes of Israel. I, I was in it for a while, and then I got out of it, because like everything else, it became a part of extremist thinking. And then all of a sudden it was projected only to Adam's race, which is the Anglo-Saxon white race. When it went that way, I pulled out of it and said, uh-uh, I'm not going down that road. And I think it's so sad that we get these wonderful truths and then people take them and rework them and organize them and then inject their own racism and sexism and all their isms into these teachings. And we've got to make sure to keep it pure. It's got to be pure spirit. Right? So, think upon these. <sighs> Shall we just take a moment? Yes, let's take a moment. I see that look on Barbara's face. Like, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Here we go. Is the look on Barbara's face? Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's take a deep breath and just take a, a couple of minutes. <sighs> just to breathe. And, oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You've opened the windows of heaven and poured down upon us in wonderful information and knowledge and lost truth. Now you put it together beyond language, beyond human thought, and activate the knowing system in all of us that we witness that the true story is being remembered 
And that story shall become flesh. The story of our life, not our living. The story of love and not our fear. The story of our oneness and not our separation. Our story of grace and not race. The story of our divinity and its wonderful journey through many incarnations to get us to where we are right at this moment, sitting here in this place or out there joining us online. Wherever you are, know that you have arrived at a certain place in your consciousness to become the light of the world. Breathe. And breathe. And breathe. This just brings up such a song in me. I'm going to try to sing it. Lord, help me. <laughs> Take the veil from off your face. Let all truth, let all error be erased. Cause it now, oh, I can't think of it. Oh, I love that song. It just came to me in my spirit, but it's not in my head. <laughs> Take the veil from off our face. Cause it now to be faced now with everlasting joy as this covering is destroyed. Take the pain from off our land as this Christ now taketh man. Wipe away all of our tears for former days have passed away. Take the veil from off our face let all death now be raised. Cause it now from joy. And let us know who we are. I'm making it up now. You get the point. I, just, I, I sing that because I just wanted to let you know I just felt some of that veil just pull back from us. So may you walk in the presence of the Shekinah glory of that which is God in you. Thank you very much for coming. You. See you Sunday, I hope. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Oh,